We're so glad you're here this evening. Uh, my name is David King. I'm a member of the faculty of the Lilly Family School of Philanthropy and director of the Lake Institute on Faith and Giving. And I'm filling in for Patrick Rooney, our associate dean for academic affairs and research, who's unfortunately ill and unable to be with us today. Uh, the Lilly Family School of Philanthropy is excited to host two of the nation's top community foundation leaders and to hear their thoughts on how we define community and community philanthropy in the 21st century. And I'm also honored and pleased to introduce our new dean, Dr. Amir Pasek. Dean Pasek has served in many key leadership positions in philanthropy and higher education. Most recently, he was vice president for international operations for CASE, the Council for Advancement and Support of Education. While at CASE, he provided strategic leadership for CASE regional offices in London, Singapore, Mexico City, and oversaw activities in Africa and other areas outside the United States. And prior to CASE, Dean Pasek served as Associate Dean for Development and Strategic Planning at Johns Hopkins University School of Advanced International Studies and is director, Executive Director of its Foreign Policy Institute, where he continues to serve as a fellow. Dean Pasek previously served as Deputy Director for the World Security Project of the Rockefeller Brothers Fund was Deputy Vice President for Advancement at the George Washington University. He holds a doctorate in political science from the University of Pennsylvania, a master's degree in international relations from Johns Hopkins, and a bachelor's degree in economics and political science from Yale University, and serves as a trustee for the Carnegie Council for Ethics and International Affairs. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Amir Passett. Thank you, David. Thank you very much. And allow me to add my own uh, words of welcome uh, to you tonight. Um, most of you as students, alumni, and leaders in philanthropy at the university and beyond, including today's distinguished speakers, have had valuable relationships with the Lilly Family School of Philanthropy. You have helped build this pioneering institution. And for that, I am grateful, both professionally and personally. As I learn more about the people who make the institution, I am eager to learn with you tonight from our discussion with two key figures in the world of community foundations. A discussion that brings together the global significance of the community foundation project and engages it with its origins and its, and its intense application in, Indi in Indiana and our neighborhood. How should we anticipate the second century of the community foundation project? As I learn more of the rich tradition of community foundations, I think how fundamental community is to the Lilly Family School of Philanthropy. Of course, there is the special community that spawned the institution, including our speakers and you, our gathered guests, and all of you are vital members of our community. But there is also community as a subject of study, research, and professional engagement, as the subject that animates the core of our school. For in every true community, there is a lot of giving going on. Many schools of business, public policy, and law, and even more centers and institutes across the board will study the importance of community in, or in organizing for political impact, for creating positive business climate, or they will study how communities are affected by commerce policy and law. Community is universally valued, but it is also universally, well, almost universally, placed in second place at best. We get to it when we address the bigger problems of state and society. There are some time-honored reasons for doing things this way, but there are also good reasons for having at least one institution that places community first one that asks what happens to all our other important questions when we put community first and see how we join together, not through commerce or coercion, but through the spirit of philanthropy. I hope you share my honor in being associated with the Lilly Family School of Philanthropy. I cannot think of a more uh, fitting venue for tonight's discussion. I look forward to learning more about what we should look forward to when we put community first. So welcome tonight to all of you. Before I introduce our distinguished speakers, I would like to recognize some special guests this evening. First of all, I'd like to recognize uh, Nick Dechakowski. He is the program officer from the Charles Stewart Mott Foundation. Welcome, Nick. Melanie Klaus, uh, the board chair of the Lilly Family School of Philanthropy and the director of the Crystal DeHaan Family Foundation. Marissa Manlove, president and CEO of the Indiana Philanthropy Alliance. And a special welcome to all our community foundation leaders who have joined us this evening from across the state. It is now my pleasure to introduce our speakers. Both have been longtime friends and supporters of the Lilly Family School of Philanthropy. And both have joined us in many significant endeavors to strengthen, educate, and inform the sector, both nationally and locally. Both are thought leaders in community foundations and philanthropy and are active in shaping its future. First, Emmett Carson, CEO and president of the Silicon Valley Community Foundation. 
He was recently selected as the first person to serve in the Charles Stewart Mott Foundation Chair on Community Foundations at our school. The chair is dedicated to understanding and strengthening community foundations. It was established by the Charles Stewart Mott Foundation to commemorate the 100th anniversary of community foundations in the United States. Nick, thank you again. As Silicon Valley Community Foundation's founding CEO, Emmett led the unprecedented merger of two of the world's largest community foundations. With over $6.5 billion now under management, it is the largest grant maker to Bay Area nonprofits. It is the it's the largest international grant maker among U.S. community foundations as well. Before joining the Silicon Valley Community Foundation, Emmett led the Minneapolis Foundation, and before that, he oversaw the Ford Foundation's U.S. and global grant making programs on philanthropy and the nonprofit sector. He was also, I am pleased to report, uh, the person who delivered the keynote at the inauguration of our school in 2013. He also served on our board of directors when we were a center. In addition to community foundation and grant making expertise, Emmett is also a noted authority on issues of social justice, public accountability, and African American giving. Our second speaker is Brian Payne, President and CEO of Central Indiana Community Foundation. He has led the 750 million CICF and the Annapolis Foundation since November 2000. Under his leadership, the Foundation's annual grant making budget doubled to almost $50 million. CICS staff and board redefined the Foundation's business model and created clarity and focus on how best to accomplish its mission to inspire, support, uh, and philanthropy leadership and service in central Indiana. A major focus of CICF is developing, attracting, and retaining highly educated, creative, entrepreneurial, and community-minded people to central Indiana. Brian is also founder and leader of Indianapolis Cultural Trail, a legacy of Gene and Marilyn Glick, an eight-mile pedestrian and bicycle pathway that connects significant arts, cultural, heritage, and sports venues in Indianapolis' downtown. He's been very involved in the Indianapolis community for the past two decades. Prior to that, Brian was managing director of the Indiana Repertory Theater, where he now serves on its board. He also served on several local boards, including CEOs for cities, the Indy Chamber, Downtown Indy, Great Indianapolis Progress Committee, and Visit Indy. It is safe to say that few people know the community they serve better than Brian does. Tonight, we will begin with Emmett's remarks, and then we will ask Brian to respond and give the local, local perspective. And then we will wrap up, wrap up with a question and answer, allowing everybody to participate uh, with questions and discussion. Please join me in welcoming uh, the Charles Stewart Mott Foundation Community Foundation's Emmett Carson. Thank you for that very kind introduction. Good evening. Good evening. Hi, it's, it's, oh, it's not that late yet. Good evening. Good evening. All right, I am happy to be here. And let me just, just note for the record, you know, uh, yesterday uh, in California, it was uh, 73 degrees. So your real friends come in January. That's when your real friends come. And so I'm happy uh, to be here. It is both a privilege and a profound honor to be the first C.S. Mott Foundation Chair for Community Foundations at the Lilly Family School of Philanthropy. I feel an awesome weight of responsibility in this role to explain, question, and advance the field of community foundations. Explaining where community foundations have been, where they are today, and trying to predict where they will be is a huge task. Oddly enough, one of the central questions facing community foundations today is defining their community identity and what is meant by community. I'm reminded of the old saying, it's not the things that you don't know that get you into trouble, but the things you know for sure that are not so. In writing Community and Community Foundations in the Next Century, in the classic book, An Agile Servant, over 25 years ago, Paul Ivasaka made the following bold prediction. He said, there will also be a proliferation of kinds of community foundations in the foreseeable future. One can expect not only differing scales of operation from neighborhood to region and state, 
but also differential adaptations in form and style to diversifying constituencies, needs, and cultures. In my remarks today, I want to try to convince you of three things. First, Paul Ilvesaka was right, and we are today seeing a proliferation of different kinds of community foundations. Second, the shifting definition of what community means is creating a profound identity crisis for place-based institutions including the entire field of community foundations. And third, this new era of differing kinds of community foundations is to be celebrated as the natural and in my mind long overdue evolution of these institutions. We should see this as a tangible sign of their continued relevance and growing maturity. So let's get started with a discussion of the meaning of community. The word community has two distinct meanings. The first definition refers to people who live in a particular geography, whether it's a neighborhood, a part of town, a city, a region, a state, country, hemisphere, or the entire globe of humanity. The other definition of community is a group of people who have a shared interest. Those interests can be both professional or personal, and there is no limit to the number of interests a single individual can have. Both of these definitions of community simultaneously coexist for all of us all of the time. For example, I'm a Silicon Valley resident, a Californian, an American, an African American, a husband, son, father, African art collector, visiting university professor, and a foundation CEO all at the same time. These multiple communities of which I'm a part are not in conflict with each other, but rather comfortably coexist with me at all times. As our nation was being founded, it is interesting to remember that people once had a stronger identification with their state of birth than to the nation of the United States. In fact, the underlying political argument that led to the Civil War was whether the federal government could force states to end slavery or whether states had sovereign rights to engage in slavery without the consent of the federal government. Many of those who fought for either the North or the South made their decisions based on their allegiance to their home state. Now, when community foundations were created beginning in 1914, they organized themselves based on their local geographical identity, usually a major city, Cleveland, Chicago, Minneapolis, Indianapolis, and New York were among the very first community foundations. It was natural for these early institutions and for those that followed to see themselves as having an exclusive ownership of their geographical area. Each community foundation had its own distinct priorities tied to its local community, and local residents almost exclusively wanted to support local efforts. This circumstance allowed community foundations to develop organizational norms in which they behaved more like franchised operations rather than independent organizations. McDonald's is one of the world's premier franchises. It has a central management structure that controls who is given a franchise, how closely they are located to each other. It manages brand identity, monitors performance, and ensures that the products are generally the same. Amazingly, at any McDonald's the world over, the french fries do taste the same. Certainly, community foundations are not franchised operations. They share, instead, they're more like members of a trade association. 
They share broad interest in the laws affecting their work and in sharing best practices, but every community foundation is different in their effectiveness, programs, fees, and structure. Today, Americans are incredibly mobile. According to the U.S. Census Bureau of the 50 states, there are only 10 where 70% or more of the residents live in the state in which they were born. Indiana is at 68%. At the other extreme, there are six states where the number of people born in the state of residence ranges from a low of 24% to a high of 44%. Perhaps not so surprisingly, California has nearly 54% of people born in the state living there. Louisiana has the highest percentage of residents born in the state at 78%, and Nevada has the lowest at 24%. Where am I going with this? These stats indicate that more and more people will have an affinity to multiple places over their lifetime. Fewer and fewer people are being born and die in the place where was their home state, their hometown. Yes, we all have a hometown. However, as we move from place to place, we add to our sense of connection to those other places. We don't substitute our relationships to our hometown, but rather we, need, we add new and vibrant connections. The fact that today we can easily maintain these relationships through technology helps to keep these relationships fresh and current regardless of the distance involved. Through Facebook, LinkedIn, texting, FaceTime, Skype, and yes, if you are old fogey like me, even email. <laughs> there are ways to stay in touch with every acquaintance you have ever met. In addition, these new technologies have allowed people who have shared interest to form new communities, an infinite number of online communities, communities such that they even take on other personas through their avatars. That's how far we've gone in the shape of community. Some of you are looking, what's an avatar? An avatar is you go online, you create a whole nother identity, you may have a whole, you may be an animal, you may be a hybrid shape, you may be anything. And you create a whole nother person, a whole nother entity. You may be part of a whole nother community. Some people say, really? Yes, really. And it's real to those people. They exchange currency. They, they make group decisions. So community is now an infinite sense of shared ideas that we never had before in the past. So let me keep going. What, what, one other thing I want to make about this. What's important about these online communities is that how you gain status is through your knowledge of whatever the community is gathered around. So in academia, knowledge is based on how many degrees you have, right? Your doctor, your assistant professor, your professor, your chair. It's real clear who has status. In online community, you have none of those status things. It doesn't matter how old you are. So somebody who's very young, their trade name may be uh, Car X2. But Car X2 knows everything about a particular car, but it's a 12-year-old kid. But they're the ones that people listen to because online that persona has developed a reputation. The reputation isn't tainted by age, by somebody's perception of gender, by somebody's perception of race or ethnicity. And so there's a lot of power in these online communities in which it's about your knowledge 
that creates understanding, not about these observed characteristics where people make assumptions about what you may or may not know. So there, there's value. They're not better than, but they're different and have different characters. The fact that people are physically more mobile and the internet has made us far more interconnected is creating disruption for all kinds of institutions, including community foundations. With the introduction of the Fidelity Gift Fund in 1991 and the other commercial gift funds that followed, as well as the introduction of donor advised funds by some universities and United Ways, as well as others, community foundations could no longer act as if they had protected franchise operations. Residents of a community can now compare donor advised funds based on community impact, fees, investment returns, online services, community advice, and reputation. And residents of a given community are more likely to have connections to nonprofit organizations in other communities that they wish to support, both within and outside the United States. After 100 years of operating without active competition, community foundations now find themselves having to redefine their value proposition relative to these commercial gift funds, other community foundations, United Ways, women's funds, universities, and all the others that offer donor advised funds. At the heart of this identity crisis is asking and answering the question of what is the meaning of community when it comes to community foundations. Paul Ilvesaka rightly understood that the idea of community is inherently elastic. He stated the following, community is a word of elastic meaning. Its capacity to stretch has been challenged over the last century and will be tested even more dramatically during the next. The changing dimensions are not only geographical, but include forces of diversity, social fragmentation, values, and shared interest. The geographical stretching of community is actually a constant process, simultaneously moving in opposite directions, downward to the individual neighborhood and outward to embrace the entire world. And eventually, certainly with environmental concern, all of space. That's what he wrote 25 years ago. The question of how to define community is no longer as simple as it once was. Silicon Valley Community Foundation was launched in 2007. In its merger documents, the board stated the following. Our donors also know that social issues cross geographic boundaries and they hold different definitions of community. To some donors, community means their own neighborhood. To others, it is the town where they grew up. Still others see themselves as global citizens. Silicon Valley Community Foundation will meet donor partners where they are and support their personal definition of building community locally, nationally, and around the globe. Silicon Valley Community Foundation is both the largest funder of nonprofit organizations in the nine county Bay Area and the largest international grant maker among community foundations. This desire to meet donors where they are is not limited to Silicon Valley Community Foundation. The community foundations of Rhode Island, Minnesota, Oregon, Foundation for the Carolinas, Arizona, Delaware, among others, have defined themselves as serving their entire states. Notwithstanding their names, there are other community foundations successfully operating within those states that are serving more local communities. For example, the Minneapolis Foundation, where I served as CEO for 13 years, traces its history back to 1915 
operates and coexists in the same geography as the Minnesota Community Foundation. Similarly, the California Community Foundation, which essentially serves Los Angeles County, but by its name, presumably serves the entire state that also has 55 other community foundations, including Silicon Valley Community Foundation. Moreover, there are a growing number of community foundations that are experimenting with broadening their reach to accommodate the changing needs and desires of their local donors. In effect, they are experimenting with Ilva Sacra's elasticity of community in the 21st century. For example, the Boston Foundation acquired the philanthropic initiative to enable its donors to engage in more national and global work. Greater Horizons was created by the Greater Kansas City Community Foundation to provide smaller community foundations across the United States and their donors with back office services. And the Foundation for the Carolinas is providing back office services to major corporations across the country around disaster relief. Clearly, we are witnessing the proliferation of different kinds of community foundations, just as Ilva Saka predicted. In conclusion, how should we interpret these changes to the definition of community? Do these developments spell the end of community foundations? As a visiting chair and an alumnus, I also have an honorary degree from the school. I hope you will allow me to be presumptuous enough to use IUPI as a mini case study of how the elasticity of community is affecting place-based institutions. Indiana University was created in 1820, and I want to share three quick facts to demonstrate how closely Indiana University's identity is tied to the state of Indiana. First, every president since Andrew Wiley, Indiana University's first president, has followed the tradition Mr. Wiley set by answering the question of what advantage is a college to community at their installation ceremony. Second, in 1852, the Indiana State Legislature declared Indiana University to be the university of the state. And third, student and faculty of Indiana are called what? Come on now. We're, we're called what? Hoosiers. And what's the nickname for residents of the state? Hoosiers. All right. Clearly, Indiana University was established to serve the residents of Indiana. And yet, imagine my surprise when I visit the red site, website and read with interest of IUPI's, quote, strong desire to become a global university. The website states, we welcome students from around the globe and are committed to increasing the number of international students on our campus. Their presence enriches campus life and turns every classroom into a cultured exchange. It proudly states that there are over 1,800 international students on the IUPI campus alone, representing 6% of the student body. In addition, I have no doubt that there are many more students who attend this great university who are from states other than Indiana. Has Indiana University lost its way? Is it no longer concerned with Mr. Wiley's perennial question of what advantage is a college to a community? Should it only admit people who are Hoosiers by birth? The answer is, of course not. Indiana University is doing what every forward-thinking, place-based community institution must do if it is the main re to remain relevant in a global society. It is embracing a world in which community is no longer static and fixed, 
but dynamic and interconnected. Cities are doing the same thing. For example, Indianapolis was recently selected into the Brookings Institutions and J.P. Morgan Chase Global Cities Initiative. Indianapolis is the 20th largest export market in the United States and hopes this program will help it to develop, to develop strategies to expand into Africa, Asia, and Latin America. Acceptance of these trends is not a rejection of the past, but rather a necessary and astute embrace of what I call a global future where local and global destinies become increasingly intertwined. In their own way, community foundations are facing similar challenges and opportunities. My own view is that we are witnessing both an end and a beginning. Like the caterpillar that becomes a butterfly, community foundations are coming of age. Some will remain what they always have been and thrive. Others will become something different and also thrive. And yes, there will be some that will be unsuccessful at whatever path they take, and they will wither away. Those different kinds of community foundations that achieve success will share the same DNA to help diverse people within an elastic definition of community to reach broad consensus on how to address difficult social issues. The medical profession has been able to develop different kinds of institutions, community clinics, research hospitals, specialty hospitals, and all-purpose general hospitals that serve different and overlapping communities. Similarly, the education profession has developed community colleges, private four-year colleges, research universities, state universities, and online universities that serve different and overlapping communities. These ecosystems at times partner with each other and at times compete with each other to achieve different but related missions. There is no reason why we should not believe and expect that community foundations cannot and will not serve different and overlapping communities in the same ways that the professions of medicine, education, and banking, among many others, have done. Accepting this new understanding of community will require that community foundations give up acting as if they operate as franchises within a protected geographical area. They must also realize that local donors will be increasingly interested in supporting projects at home, across the nation, and overseas. After all, when those of you who are students graduate and move to communities across the nation and likely around the world, what would be your response if your local community foundation in which you established your donor advised fund was unwilling to process your annual gift to this university or the nonprofit from your hometown or your hometown in another country? The world and local communities have become inextricably tied together. The issues of environment, jobs, and health, among other issues, will require a complex understanding of what is occurring in the local community with an understanding of the international context. The very best community foundations will continue to reflect the interests of residents within their local community, and the charitable interests of those residents will increasingly be a mix of local national and global concerns. It is my belief that our world can only benefit from community foundations that can meet these 21st century definitions of community. Thank you very much.